Welcome to the Cricket Sadist Hour. This is an emergency meeting, uh, 24 hours probably after we wanted to do an emergency meeting, but it's still an emergency. There's there's still crisis. There's still uh, uh, all sorts of things happening in Australian cricket. And with me, I have perhaps the uh, the best rubbish off spinner and uh, part-time middle order batsman that Australian cricket has never used. It's Gideon Haig. How are you? I'm only 47, Jared. There's still There's still time. There is. Uh, unfortunately, I think you had a better relationship with the previous coach than you do with the next coach, but, you know, we'll leave that there. I quite like Buff, actually. I interviewed him. I had a very enjoyable and quite memorable interview with him when his autobiography came out. And uh, I've, I still I nurse a very high opinion of him. Um, but we can get to that down the track. Yeah, but does he? But I just would have thought that, you know, you, you're too much of a plotter for him. He's looking for more runs. He's looking for more wickets. He's looking for more action. And you're just not giving him what he's looking for. Well, I'm mature. There's no doubt about that. <laughs> <laughs> that is... say overwrite. Right. Now, I want to, we'll start straight with Mickey Arthur um, because that's what Cricket Australia did. They started with him and then uh, he's now gone. Um, Mickey Arthur was uh, basically, from what I could tell, uh, he was a little bit unlucky in that Australia played a really bad game in the Champions Trophy. They had a washout that they probably should have won. Um, and then the third the third part of that was having to chase a total in 21.9, uh, 29.1 overs, which was always going to be tricky. Do you think, had they beat New Zealand and got over over, New, over Sri Lanka, that he would still have been fired? Yeah, it's possible. Yeah, you've got, it's a good point. Um, this does seem to have happened in a, in a screaming hurry. Uh, in fact, certainly Mickey Arthur was the last one to know. It does seem amazing that in this day and age of process-driven gradualism that Mickey Arthur can have walked into a meeting with the chief executive and executive general manager of, of Cricket Australia without knowing what it was about and have walked out 15 minutes later without a job. Uh, you know, this is the sort of thing that, that, that England used to do and were ill-famed for uh, and is, of course an enormous contrast to the labyrinthine processes of Arthur's appointment when we spent months uh, soul-searching and, and introspecting and producing a high-profile report with a team of wise greybeards. Uh, and now it looks very much like we make policy on the run um, in a very reactive and, and almost capricious fashion. I'm going to throw this out there, and I, I do like Mickey Arthur, although I never thought he was the right coach, uh, but I thought he was the coach that Australia wanted. But I'm going to throw this out there. We, we, you know, you've got a relationship with him as well, but is it possible that Australia have ended up with the right coach at the right time, even if uh, it's not particularly his fault? No, no. Well, of course, the team changed. This isn't the team that he began coaching. The, the team that he began coaching still contained Ricky Ponting and, and Michael Hussey, still had a, a kind of a bedrock of experience around which to build. And through no fault of me, all of a sudden a, a leadership vacuum has opened up. And I guess it is arguable that uh, a team of all of a sudden very young and callow players needs uh, a more hands-on coach, uh, more deliberate one-to-one -one interaction rather than perhaps the kind of, I don't know, project manager coach that, that Arthur was. Of course, Arthur's previous experience had been with a very uh, experienced and uh, team full of distinguished players. Uh, the, the scenario had changed and perhaps the easiest way in which to accommodate that change was to change the coach. It also feels to me like Mickey Arthur is almost too nice to be a head coach. I mean, this seems to be the second time that not, I mean, I think he's got, he definitely had a role to play in this, uh, but not particularly through a fault of his own. He's ended up being shafted um, yet again. And, you know, he can't, it's not like he could have been out there at uh, 2.30 in the morning at the walkabout. Well, he could have been there, but he's probably lucky he wasn't for many reasons. It's a terrible establishment to drink in, um, if nothing else. But it's not like uh, he should have been out there holding Warner's arm back to make sure that he didn't throw the punch. And it seems like he's such a nice guy that everyone always sort of, uh, he's the easiest person to get rid of, the permanent scapegoat in world cricket. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you made the point the other day that, you know, so many uh the you know the, the the chorus of former player opinion in Australia after the homework gate uh, scandal was you know how can you treat these players as schoolboys and of course all they've done is gone out and behaved like schoolboys uh, so perhaps 
And Mickey never quite got the balance right. You know, he tried to be too much of the disciplinarian in India, and he actually tried to trust in the players' maturity and goodwill here, and he was kind of whipsawed by by um, equal and opposite effects. Yeah. Um, I mean, we talk about sort of him being the scapegoat, and you, I mean, you talk directly. You said there's a leadership vacuum in Australian cricket, and it's quite obvious that it is within the team. But what is interesting is that we had... Let me let me make sure. We had Sutherland, Howard, Arthur, Clark, and Buff all um, do press conferences the other I said day. There was I, a, mean, I said there was a leadership vacuum, not a management vacuum. <laughs> it's, a, it's a management, management overload. Nice and tightly. I mean, they're everywhere, aren't they? Uh, I've been, I think, I'm going to go out there and say that other than his close personal friends, and as much as I've never quite understood what he does, I think I've been Pat Howard's biggest um, backer. And in that every time he's been abused, I've been there to say to the people who've abused him, actually, I think you're talking nonsense, even though mm. I'm not, you know, 100% on Pat Howard's side. Uh, Pat Howard is there because the buck has to stop with someone. Um, yeah. Did the buck get jumped over in this case, Gideon? Well, what happened to the buck? Why did the buck not yeah. stop? It was it was either Arthur or Howard, wasn't it? Um, and, you know, perhaps Howard got his shove in before Arthur managed his, his counter shove. It's um, yeah. I mean, you're right. The one of the express objectives of the Argus review was to create a greater degree of accountability in in Australian cricket, and all it's resulted in is even more diffusion of accountability. I mean, don't forget, there's a manager of this team too, Gavin Dovey, who I would have thought had some sort of responsibility for enforcing discipline. So perhaps there was some sort of question over his role in the failure to um, to, to punish Warner uh, expeditiously and appropriately. But no one seems to have, have, have raised a question about, about his involvement. What was interesting, uh, when um, when Warner actually was involved with the punch, Glenn, uh, Glenn Maxwell? Glenn Maxwell's no, nowhere around. Jim Maxwell was in the press box and we were having a chat. And he said, what do you think Dovey's role in this is? And I literally said, I'd forgotten he exists. Um, yeah. It's almost like he just he's just disappeared. Because the manager role used to be such an important role in, yeah. in the Australian team environment, didn't it? Well, it did. And uh, there's also, I might add, an executive general manager of people and culture at Cricket Australia, Marianne Rue, who's been there for the last 18 months, who, if you look at her LinkedIn profile, says that one of her chief responsibilities is the creation of a high-performance leadership culture for the Australian national men's cricket team. So I wonder how her last performance review went, because I don't see any improvement in that um uh, in those outcomes, why isn't that particular manager being held accountable? I mean, her job title and her actual description of her job both sound made up, so it's possible that she doesn't exist. I don't know if you've met her or not. She might be the Troy Cooley of high performance managers. <laughs> uh, yeah, do you look, think then that like, uh, Howard is just a little bit cleverer than Anne Arthur? Because like I said, I, I always felt with South Africa that Arthur was... Um, I, I felt that Graham Smith was under a lot of pressure and suddenly Arthur was thrust forward as the problem with the team. Um, yeah. I like I don't think there's any way of getting around the fact that Mickey Arthur hasn't performed the way that he should have and that he's let the team get out of control. Although, as you said, not everything is his fault. But, I mean, Pat Howard seems to just have gone, well, wait a minute, if, if, we, don't win, uh, if we don't win this Ashes, my job's under the gun. Is it worth me just pushing um, Arthur forward? Mm. Yeah, well, interesting, I had... I talking to someone from Cricket Australia last week. There's some people there who still talk to me. And the question was raised, well, who will get sacked? Who will, who will be the first one over the side? Now, I suggested Pat Howard. Uh, but the other person suggested John Everardi. Um, don't forget, he's got a role in this as well. Uh, we both missed Arthur uh, because I think we had a perception that, um, and I think it's a rightful perception, that when it comes to national coaching, uh, the national coach can really only affect a player, I think, at the margins, only by three or four percent. Once you get through to international level, you know, you're a good player. Uh, you've got, you're meant to have basic skills. And in some respects, Arthur has become a victim of the fact that we're not producing players of the finished quality that used to come through to a to test cricket in Australia. He's, he's being expected to do too much remedial work He's being expected to start from square one with a lot of players. Whereas John Buchanan 
had the luxury of being able to, you know, work with the, the one or two percent um, addition that, that, that he could make to individuals like Shane Warne and, and Steve Warne, and probably didn't, he had no impact on, on Shane Warne's uh, career at all. Uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, the, the, the role of the coach in the Australian team is being changed by the game. And we somehow think that if we change the coach, we can get away without changing the game. You know, there's all these complaints about the current culture in Australian cricket, but no one's actually asking the question, how did we, how did we come up by this culture in the first place? You can't just mandate a healthy culture. You can't just announce that you're going to have a healthy culture. You've got to create the conditions precedent to it. And they include, um, you know, social and economic forces over which the cricket administration has much more control than the coach. Well, let's talk about that because, I mean, you'll be shocked to know, Gideon, that I, you know, maybe I'm, I'm waggling my finger at a particular person. Uh, this person's been in the job for 12 years. Um, had, had he had his way, I believe Tim Nielsen would still currently be coach under Tim Nielsen's yeah. extended coaching contract. Um, in the press conference, he was the first person to speak. Uh, he was also the least impressive speaker. That you know, not the public speaking is the most important thing in the world, but he was the least impressive, and he was the person who I thought shifted the blame the most, uh, which was mm. James Sutherland. I mean, it, it, it's phenomenal that you know he's made this mistake. If Mickey Arthur was the wrong coach, and the Argus Review wasn't uh, implemented correctly, and Pat Howard is not the right man, and Michael Clark shouldn't be selector, it, it seems to me that so many mistakes are made by cricket administrators. And then if they never pay, they just never pay. I mean, Wally, Wally um, Clark came out. Oh, sorry, Wally Edwards came out and said that I just amalgamated and um, Jack Clark and Wally Edwards there because sometimes I can't tell. I don't even you're know they've of, changed. Yeah, your portmanteau cricket administrator is Wally Clark. Yeah, it's sort of a big. <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, he's come out and said he backed Sutherland, but I, I wonder why they're so ha they're so quick to back yeah. Sutherland, and why you know Sutherland was so he, Sutherland should say I've made a mistake here. I wasn't. I didn't have my eye on the ball. This is under my watch. This is a mistake that I'm going to rectify. I saw nothing of that sort. I mean, he was really strong on what Warner had done wrong, but he wasn't really particularly yeah. strong on what he had done wrong and how what his role was in this and. It, yeah. if, the, if the administration isn't a massive part of this, I don't know what is. Far more than Mickey Arthur. Mickey Arthur's a recent part of it. But overall, it's Cricket Australia who've caused this problem. Yeah, well, Wally Edwards, actually, um, the expression he used was tracking well. He said that, um, that, that Sutherland and Cricket Australia were tracking well. <sighs> uh, and I guess, you know, there is an argument that it is commercially tracking extremely well. It's just sold... Uh, it's television rights to Channel 9 for another five years for a grossly inflated sum. How would you be feeling if you were David Gingell from Channel 9? Like a rube who sort of tipped the absolute top of the market to buy? Uh, you know, Australian cricketers at the moment are looking very, very expensive. And Sutherland is also the man who signed off on a memorandum of understanding with a fixed proportion, wherein a fixed proportion of these inflated cricket revenues will be going straight to the players. So the players will be being paid, whether they perform or not, vastly more sums, over, uh, vastly higher sums over the next five years. Uh, irrespective of uh, how the team does on the field, it'll be affected at the margins. There is a, there is a performance-related quotient in there. But you know, once again, this is another Argus Review recommendation that hasn't really been followed through. We were meant to be evaluating the teams in terms of absolute performance, and all we've ended up doing is leveraging them to the television rights cycle, which is um, continues to work on an upward trajectory. Well, the, the thing with the television, I, I had a lot of people, you know, sort of say to me, "Well, wait, he, of course his job is safe. He's just signed this massive five hundred million dollar deal." Um, but I mean, other than the Champions League, I don't see a cricket rights deal in in cricket that's not going up. Um, mm. I would say that almost every uh, you know yeah. deal is going up, no matter what the administrations do. In some cases, um, they do seem to be on this permanent rise. So there are things I do think they've got really right at Cricket Australia, and like such as the fact that you can watch the entire press conference on their website, that you can watch every Shield match on their website. Mm. But then right next to James Sutherland's head in that press conference was that ma the ad for their magazine, Top Order, their lifestyle and travel magazine. Um, oh, okay. 
Well, I mean, that would make me want to travel, that particular image. And I just think that they've also made a lot of mistakes. And the most important thing, I, I hear Giles Clark say this all the time, you know, if, if the team's doing well and we're making money, I must be doing well. Well, with Sutherland, I'm not sure that he took over when a team with this amazing team, and it obviously did well for a few years. But the minute that team started to break down, I'm not quite sure that they've done a brilliant job at, at really finding it or being able to bring it back. Well, I think, you know, often... Uh, cricket teams succeed in spite of administration rather than because of it. I mean, just because the West Indies dominated the cricket world in the 1980s and 1990s didn't make their administrators geniuses. Uh, you know, administrators are defined, successful administrations uh, are defined by being in the right place at the right time sure. and, and the capacity for taking credit effectively and for distancing themselves from, from stuff-ups. Uh, and so far... James Sutherland, in the course of 12 years, has been very successful at doing that. His misfortune, perhaps, is that he took the job so young. You know, he was 36, I think, when he became chief executive. He's 48 next month. He's been in the job for 12 years, and that's much longer than the average life expectancy of a CEO in Australia, let alone one in sport. I think he genuinely does love cricket, and he does love his job, and that's one of the reasons he can't imagine a job where he'd be happier or or more suited, but you know, for his own sake, I would have, I would have thought that if he wanted to work out if he could succeed in the wider world, he would be wanting to look at other areas in which he he might excel. Uh, but then again, you look at you look around the the senior administration at Cricket Australia, it's not obvious who would succeed him. I think it would have to be uh, an external candidate. And you know, external candidates have their strengths and weaknesses. Well, what I find interesting is that he was there in the first place because it's almost like I'm going to call him Wally Clark again, the Wally Clark amalgamation of Australian chairman. If that was the ECB, we know Giles Clark would have been there. You know, if that was India, we know Srinivasan would have been there. Uh, it, it's very interesting that how how powerful that CEO position has been. Perhaps because he's he's been there longer than the boards, but it's felt, it's always felt like we've never really had a strong chairman figure in Australian cricket. And, and I don't think that's a bad thing, but it is interesting that it is always the CEO that's out the front in these situations. Mm. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Dennis Rogers was a very strong chairman, and in fact, Dennis Rogers, of course, uh, the the chief ex time, Graham Halbish, ran foul of Dennis Rogers because Dennis was an interventionist chairman who did take a kind of a quasi-executive uh, role. But yes, you're right in the sense that the, the, the chairmanship at Cricket Australia rotates, so the chief executive is going to outlast each chairman, and the chairman is appointed more or less on a, or has been ro on, a, on a rotation basis among the different states, which means that it's never necessarily the best chairman. It's the chairman whose turn it is or has been uh, in the recent past. Governance is changing at, um, at Cricket Australia, of course, at a rather glacial pace. And it would be interesting to know what the board's attitude to the change of coach was. You know, did, um, was James Sutherland acting off his own account or was he carrying out a diktat of the board? Uh, pretty sure that we'll never get to the bottom of that of that answer because you know what happens in the cricket australia boardroom is um you know chatham house rules but it, this is this did seem like the kind of event where a sort of there was a sudden um agreement on the part of key figures to act on prior apprehensions that they'd held as individuals and it just so happened that there was a good candidate around and proximate who could be slipped into the role with the minimum of at least geographic well, it's, fuss. it's an interesting candidate. I mean, we'll get to him, I suppose, in, in a little bit. But it was an, an interesting because if you're going to make the move, you're picking a player that everyone sort of loved, that was you know, quite popular with fans. Mm. You're picking a player that current players obviously really like. I mean, you know, the, whether it's an IPL or, or Queensland or even in Yorkshire, they still talk of him uh, like, like he's a current player and a mm. god. Uh, and you're also, most importantly, uh, you're going to stop Mark Waugh, Jason Gillespie, Shane Warren, <laughs> etc., from saying, well, this is, I can't believe they've picked a guy who, you know, used to be a chicken farmer and he's never picked a cricket ball up in his life. I mean, you're basically picking one of their friends, which automatically must just take, I, I know it shouldn't yeah. be a factor, but 
I would think that it, possibly for someone like Sutherland, it might be a factor because it's just the easier decision, isn't it? Hmm. Well, that that is that's certainly a, a criteria that that he fills very well. You know, he will have the. You know, he's already talked about reintroducing the legends to the Australian dressing room. In other words, he wants them inside the tent pissing out rather than outside pissing in. So, yes, he comes with enormous advantages. And it is interesting that he immediately surfed into the job on this wave of goodwill. Not that he doesn't deserve it. Yeah, it's interesting what you say, though, because he did go on and on about bringing past legends into the team and all this sort of thing. And I was thinking, well, wait a minute. We just had Craig McDermott. Are you you know, whether he stepped down or stepped aside or was pushed, uh, you know, that, that depends on who you talk to um, in the, you know, Australian setup. Uh, you just got Justin Langer, who's obviously left. It's not like the team was lacking legends. I mean, they were around. You know, there were Australian cricketers everywhere. Di Venuto is involved. Um, you know, you've got Stuart Law and Academies. There was a lot of people there. It, it You know, just because the main coach isn't a, you know, 50-test uh, player who, who sweated blood for Australia. I mean, he played 100-and-something first-class games, Mickey Arthur. Yep. He knew a little bit about cricket. Yeah, and the other thing is that Lehman has succeeded, I think, in uh, in environments, for instance, at Queensland, where he has kind of unilateral power. He's never really had to deal with an, an over-elaborated management structure. Uh, he's kind of extremely effective as as the, the, the single go-to guy, but how is he going to work in with this uh, extraordinarily elaborate bureaucracy that, that Cricket Australia have created around the team? Uh, he, he, I think he's. It's not only the team that he's going to have to change. It's actually going to have to be the structures around it. Wow. I mean, I, I'd love to see how. So he's just going to take all of those middle managers out for diet cokes and um, warm them up. Well, the fact is that you know I think he he will enjoy a lot of discretion in the next six months because they need him. They desperately need him to succeed. Um, the people who've made the appointment. Otherwise, they look like total rubes and, and montebanks. Is it also, uh, it's a weird, I'm, I'm going to put this on two things. The two things that basically Cricket Australia have been going for for a little while is uh, like this family-friendly environments, uh, you know, bring your family to the cricket, family, family, bring your kids to the cricket. Mm. And the other one, of course, is going after the, the markets that they've never played that well to, where Asian kids and uh, kids from um, non uh, non-cricket backgrounds and these sorts of things. <laughs> he's not a family-friendly figure. Um, he's more a man's man. And he's got the history of, and I'm, you can't say the word and I can't say the word, but he did go into a changing room and, you know, have an issue with Sri Lankans which involved racial, which I believe is the first ever swear word in wisdom, by the way, was that incident. Um, it was after that guy flashed his penis, but it was the first ever swear word, I believe, in wisdom. Um, so he's got a racial background with Sri Lankans and he's got, you know, this smoke mm. and beer sort of, you know, uh, every man uh, sort of guy. It, is it an, it's an interesting fit for Cricket Australia at this point, uh, considering where they've pushed themselves, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And um, on the on the on the other, I wouldn't want Lehman's career to be defined by half a second of of uh, of anger. I don't think that's fair on on anyone in particular. And in fact, if you look at Lehman's overall behavioural record, it, I think it's pretty close to, to blameless, despite the fact that he now might have this kind of residual reputation as a, um, as a rebel. Uh, he was simply a, you know, a, a cricketer who knew his own mind and, and knew his own value and tended to be pretty uncompromising in the way in which he pursued it. You, can't, you also can't say that he was a, you know, a particular favourite of, of Cricket Australia's. You know, he went almost 10 years between his being a 12th man for Australia and, and actually playing his first test match. Well, that's why I was... want to bring that up as well. I mean, because uh, we've got a situation where Mark Cosgrove is still in Tasmania uh, and still looks like one of the better cricketers. Obviously, Luke Pomersbatch as well, on pure talent, um, is mm -hmm. one of the better cricketers. But they, they've both been probably, in Pomersbatch's case, uh, rightly, and in, in maybe in Cosgrove's wrongly, pushed aside because they don't fit the, the current, you know, mm -hmm athletic, um, go-getting attitude that they want from Australian cricketers. Um, and yet Darren Lehman basically refused to get fit and said, I'm going to make enough runs, you're going to have to eventually pick me. Mm. Which is sort of yeah. the opposite to what modern Australian cricket has become. Yeah. Took him a while. <laughs> Took, Took him a while for that message to get through. Yeah. Uh, and for him to make the argument on the uh, on the basis of the, of the weight of runs. But if you look at... 
I think that's one of the interesting things about Lehman looking at his career. Uh, it's not that long ago. I mean, the man is only 43, but the circumstances under which he came to maturity as a cricketer are so remote, so different from the circumstances under which these players graduated. I mean, Lehman was the guy who wouldn't go to the academy, was offered a place in the academy and, and didn't go because he was working on the, um, on the assembly line at Holden in Elizabeth, uh, having left school at, at the age of 16. I think that's one of the, the valuable attributes that he brings to the job is the, is the range of uh, personal experiences which are very remote from the experiences of, of his young charges. But it also focuses our mind on just how much Australian cricket has changed in the last five years. And the attitudes that that can't help but inculcate in this particular squad I'll, I'll go back to this argument again. Uh, you know, we can't just mandate a culture. We can't just say we're going to have a really good culture in the Australian cricket team, and and we're going to put so many managers around it. They're going to help protect the team from the kind of the forces that actually create culture. We have exactly the culture in Australian cricket that we deserve, and you sort of wonder how on earth could it have been otherwise. I think maybe a few more managers, and they, they might have had it done, but I could be wrong. Well, management always thinks that the solution to problems is more management. Uh, it's a kind of an iron law of bureaucracy, and Cricket Australia has surrendered to it. Now, I was thinking about this. I was, I was writing notes. You know me. I like to prepare. So in the three minutes I waited for you to click on the link, I wrote notes. And one of the notes I wrote was that essentially, when in many different ways, and even more so, I'd forgotten about the whole leaving school thing um, and not going to the academy. But in almost every way, Darren Lehman is the anti-Michael Clark. He's had the hard road. He's had to earn it a lot more. He was never pushed forward. He was probably a better shield batsman than Michael Clark ever mm ever was, even as a young man, other than maybe one rough season for Victoria very early on. Um, you know, he it seems like every player he's ever played with loves him. Even opposition players quite love him. And like there's almost a cult around him, uh, and which has been really helpful for him as a coach, where people just feel almost instantly comfortable with him um, as a guy. And it seems that every way you look at that, it's almost the opposite of what Michael Clark's um, had and what Michael Clark's become. And yet, of course, if you recall, the the Lehman's retirement was probably accelerated by Clark, because they were in the same team in, in in India in 2004. And you you might remember Lehman's comments about you know leave me out of the team because I you know I feel Clark is the future, and you know I'd be quite comfortable if I was excluded uh, if it gave uh, Clark the opportunity. And I think that was a, there was a degree of self-projection involved because, of course, Lehman had, had to wait so long for his opportunity. He didn't want to feel as though he was an obstacle to the progress of another young talent. So they do have that interesting kind of overlap in their career. And I think that was a personally quite a deeply felt episode in, in Lehman's career. Uh, Post the you know the death of, of David Hooks, which I think is a kind of a defining experience for uh, for Lehman, and I don't, I don't necessarily see them as as, as as complete opposites. Perhaps in in terms of, of, of public perception, I think they do share. Um, they are kindred spirits in the amount of forethought that they give to their games. I think they're both you know very good thinkers on the game. But, you know, they're as different as the environments in which they grew up. Yes, you're quite right. Um, it's hard to imagine Michael Clark on the assembly line at, uh, at, at Holden and Elizabeth. I visited there a couple of weeks ago, funnily enough, and uh, I could see Buff there, but I couldn't see Pup. Yeah. Well, I mean, but even even in general, you couldn't see, um, you couldn't see Pup as the sort of person who wouldn't take a, uh, an academy spot. Uh, mm. You could never really see him, and, and I'm not being unfair in this, but you could never really see him like Buff being, you know, uh, cast aside and having to work mm. for it as much. It, it, you know, yeah. it all came to Clark the way it was supposed to come to Clark, um, even if it was Shane Watson's injury that finally, you know, really propelled him um, as a player. Whereas you, you felt with Lehman, like you know, the plane, the, the team could die in a, you know, in a plane accident. And he still might not be in the first 11 because, you know, Bob Simpson was angry with him or someone thought he was too fat or, or something like that. There was always something there with Lehman. Um, it, it, but it, that's all, almost what I'm saying is it's almost the, the perfect person to come in to this team at this time because I think maybe Arthur and Clark were a bit more, uh, you know, uh, not, not similar, but 
Lehman, Lehman automatically gets respect, whether it's from the ex-players or the current yeah. players. He automatically gets a certain amount of respect, which I don't think Michael Clark's ever truly earned until very yeah. recently, and he only did it through making an amazing amount of runs. Yeah, and I think the other thing is that these days, uh, for young players, it's very meaningful if their coach has experience at the top level. It might be that the next generation of coaches have to be players. Uh, you know, maybe Mike Hessen is kind of the the last of, of of his kind who hasn't played at the top level. I think players do need that feeling. Young players do that that the guy has been in their position and can kind of imagine their struggles and and can kind of empathise with them because empathy, of course, is uh, the most desirable and perhaps most overrated of uh, of modern qualities. Um, it's interesting. I, I always remember like Lehman as being a bit of a failure in Test cricket, and I did look up his record as you were talking just then, just mm. to make sure I wasn't wrong before I said this. Um, his average of 44 in Test cricket in, mm. in his period, only because of the team he played with, really, was mm. seen as uh, probably under par. But realistically, he could slot 44 pretty much into any position other than Michael Clark's at the moment. Well, I reckon he could make a comeback. <laughs> He's only 43. And it's not so. When did he, he play? I think he played in the one game in the first season of the IPL too. That was, I think, that might have been his last game. Did he play one for the Rajasthan Royals? He, he de- I'm not sure if it was there, but he definitely played one one game or two games. And all I remember is it was not pretty. <laughs> well, that was T20, but in Test match cricket, it, um, it it might be a little bit different. Yeah. Um, Come out, boof. <laughs> Now, hey, look, let's be honest, if you're going to lose the Ashes, you might as well play the fifth one. He always wanted to play at Ashes in England, didn't he? It was, it, um, was it uh, 2005 they kept the Shrek figure on the front of the bus um, in honour of him, I believe? Um, because yeah, he never quite right. met... that was one of his nicknames, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, what, what did you think of Michael Clark stepping down as selector? Uh, I sort of took it at face value as someone who's just like, there's too much going on in my life, I don't want to be selector as well. And then started to hear people with conspiracy theories and talking that perhaps he was told um, to step down from it. But I, I mean, I don't know what to believe, but I, I don't think it's a bad move, whoever came up with it. Well, I mean, Clark didn't cover that position in the first place. That's an Argus review recommendation that the... Um, that the captain become a selector and it just so happened that Clark was the captain so he slipped into that role automatically. From what I understand and I've got this kind of second hand but the when the Argus committee met uh, there were three captains whose positions were considered of course there was Border, Taylor and uh, War and Border and Taylor apparently were in favour of the captain becoming a selector but War was adamantly against it because of his own unfortunate prior experiences of having to be the man who adjudicated on leaving uh, Shane Warne out of the Antigua Test match in 1999 and leaving Slater out of the Test match at the Oval in 2001. So it went through on a majority vote rather than a unanimous vote. And I think there were always misgivings about um, the position that, um, that, that Michael Clarke occupied. John Inverarity, of course, when he was captain of Western Australia, said he didn't want to be a selector. Um, you know, he had three good selectors at the time, with whom he completely trusted, whom he was happy to consult with. At, at the um, but at the end of the day, he wanted the choice to be in in other people's hands. And I think that Clark. This was once again, I think, a, a, a bit of a case of a, of a power vacuum. Um, opening up and someone being expected to fill it, and, and and that being ended up being Michael Clark. But I think, you know, in the end, he probably found, you know, if he's an even half intelligent man, that the situation is potentially full of awkwardnesses, particularly in a team at the moment that's feeling insecure about itself, that's not sure who's going to play at Trent Bridge, that isn't even sure who's in its its best top six. I was sitting down the other day, went to a lunch last week with, with Greg Chappell and we tried to name the Australian top six and we spoke for about 15 minutes and we couldn't even name the top three. Is that because he kept beating you over over the head with a chair every time you said Eddie's name? <laughs> Actually, funny enough, he was, um, he, was, he was quite warm about Eddie. He felt, that, um, he felt that Eddie was a mentally strong player and there, w- and there, weren't, there aren't many mentally strong players around in, uh, in Australian batting circles. Talking about mentally strong players, um, Steve Smith, um, 
sorry, that was unnecessary. But um, Steve, Smith, <laughs> um, Steve Smith has been added uh, to the Australian squad uh, as cover for David Warner and Michael Clark's back, um, depending on uh, what he's needed for. Um, yet again, Jim Maxwell was was around in the press box while there was nothing to do. There was a lot of rain during this test, so uh, during this tournament, so we just all sat around talking absolute nonsense, whether it was on air or off air, generally. Um, and uh, he thought he was very happy that Steve Smith was in. I was aghast that um, Steve Smith had been brought back. I just think in English conditions, he's basically Swiss cheese um, as as a batsman. Well, I think he is in most conditions, but definitely in English. But I was wondering if perhaps he was brought back because he, he you know, he's thought of as a, a good influence and a hard worker and also f- future captain. Who knows? Who knows? Um, I did a, I did a count the other day to see how many Australian cricketers there had been in England so far this season. I came up with 32. You know, Champions Trophy squad, Ashes squad and Australia A. And they're constantly coming and going and they're in different places at the same time. You know, you had that situation last week where Michael Clark and another five players were having a publicity hit on a barge near London Bridge. Meanwhile, their coach is about to be sacked. I mean, the left hand just doesn't know what the right hand is doing in Australian cricket at the moment. Well, I don't know if this is true or not. I, I, actually, I won't say who told me in case it's not true, but I believe that Australia A was told before Australia that Mickey Arthur was uh, sacked. Mm. Um, well, I think yeah, yeah. I think that the players who were out of contact with because the group hadn't actually come together for the mm. first game yet, so there were a lot of players who were um, cut off from the team and cut off from news and and didn't hear it. Uh, you know, they they left with the team having one coach and they came back and there was another one. All right. Well, there's only one really important question that I probably should have asked at the start, but we're only about half an hour in, so I'll ask it now. Do you think Australia is in a better chance to win uh, the Ashes now than they were? I don't know what was it, forty-eight hours ago. Yeah, maybe a maybe a five percent better chance. The chances weren't great, but uh, you know I think Lehman will enjoy a, a honeymoon period. Uh, I think he's the kind of coach who could be quite refreshing to to young men who are confused and um, and disoriented about their situation. He's got a capacity for kind of cutting through. Uh, niceties um, for for laying things out pretty simply, which I think is what modern players seem to want. But in the end, he's still got the same players. And uh, unless, of course, he comes out of retirement, uh, the makeup of that top six is still as um, imponderable as it was a week ago. Yeah, I no, I agree. I mean, it's unfortunately he hasn't strengthened the batting by just being around. Um, but I do, I do think that there is either going to be a dead cat bounce situation where they might play for him for the first little while, or it, he might actually just just the fact that you know he he can change uh, the way that things are done. They might actually pull together, which is maybe something that they needed. But uh, um, either way, uh, Buff, I think it's quite clear that Gideon wants you to come back more than anything. <laughs> It'll make me feel younger. (laughs) Thank you very much. I'll talk to you soon. Okay. Thanks, Jared.